Um, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Academy session on enabling US leadership in artificial intelligence for weather. I'm Mary Glacken, the chair of BASC, and we're very pleased to have all of our guests here today and very thankful for our panelists that are joining us throughout the day on this important topic. Um, before we get going with the substance of this, I want to Oh, maybe I'm not in control. I thought I was in control. <laughs> there we go. Um, so just to take a moment for safety, this is an outline of where we are in the building uh, here, and there's ready, ready at, um, exits available. And basically in the corridor, parallel corridor to our left is where you would find the restrooms should you need those. And we always like to spend a few minutes on our expectations for conduct at this meeting. Um, you know, I'm not gonna read this slide to you, but we're, our goal is really to allow all participants to be able to participate fully in an atmosphere that's free of any kind of harassment or discrimination. And then um, we need to spend a few minutes on meeting logistics. Uh, so, all are welcome, including those in this audience, to connect to Zoom if you would like. Um, if, but you should not collect, connect to the audio part. If you do, we will know it immediately. Um, <clears throat> and you'll regret that. Um, our speakers are going to use the podium today and then come and sit at the panelist ta uh, table as we go through. And um, the staff will make sure that all the participants are in mute. So the Zoom chat has been disabled and that's because we want all participants to use Slido for comments and questions. So I'll leave this code up here for a few minutes. It is easy to type in if, you, if your camera is not readily available at AI for weather there and um, that will facilitate um, our discussions. And should we have lots of questions, we're probably going to give a, a bias towards the Basque members asking questions. Okay, I think we're good. Cameras are coming down. Um, so with this, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Brad Coleman, who is one of the organizers for today's session. Thank you, Mary, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, exciting to see all of you here and it's exciting to be part of this, this workshop. Uh, very quickly, I'm, I've spent 50 years in, in, in weather information, weather services, and never in that time period has anything hit with such firestorm as AI uh, has. And, and so before I hand it over to the experts on the team, Amy and Libby, who are actively leading in the areas of machine learning and artificial intelligence, I'm speaking a little bit on sort of from my perspective, looking into, and, and what it, it truly is a disruption across the entire value chain. It's not one area we're seeing in, in observations, we're seeing AI coming in and helping us detect early sensor failures and what's going on there. In, in the middle section, the forecasting area, it, it, it's a wild, wild west from, from simple, smaller applications to throwing out everything and starting over from totally complete systems from data to the forecast and replacing all of you know, the conventional numerical weather prediction all the, way, all the way to the pointy end of the stick as far as even applications, AI applications and determining what the human response should be given a certain weather forecast. So it's across that entire spectrum. And there's never been such, you know, Firestorm, but also just unbridled enthusiasm and what's, you know, what's going, what's next? And, and I can't imagine what the next 50 years are going to bring. But also when we look at the impact of AI and how the US leadership can move ahead and become leaders in the areas, we really do have to bring a little bit of caution to it and really what is going, they need, not only, you know, they're sharing the excitement, but how do we work with the US leadership and how do they approach this with an eye that they need to balance their resources, their priorities and ambitions. And no doubt, AI is transformative, it's revolutionary. The initial results are incredible in, in what we're seeing. 
But how, how do they move that ball down the field in a way that makes sense, where we're optimally taking advantage of the limited resources? Just because we can doesn't mean we should. Uh, there's an existing infrastructure that we've built over 50 years with weather information industry and how much dismantling, what do we do? We have stakeholder requirements that we've been dealing with. We have infrastructure, we have workforce. How do we maneuver all of that in a way that we can transition or pivot in a way that we can truly in the US be leaders, global leaders in the application of AI to the weather information? And those answers where, those questions where the answer is yes, you know, across fine, how do we prioritize? How do the US agencies prioritize? How do they, do they develop new partnerships? We'll be looking at all of these through the workshop today. And, and, and the fourth bullet here is these early positive results to me don't assure future dominance over other more conventional applications. We haven't changed the earth system. It's still a chaotic system. It has certain limitations and behaviors that any application, any new tool is going to have to confront. And where does, what, what is the true end result or as we level out from these really dramatic early results? And, and again, just speaking on behalf of, of, you know, not on behalf, I shouldn't, but for, you know, recognizing the challenges that the US leadership have, how do you pivot? How do you retool? Uh, you, you can't overnight switch to a new forecasting system. So these are particularly challenging decisions and discussions that we have to have both within the US leadership, but also across the weather enterprise. And BASC is, we're really here and, and we're, we're having this workshop and we're looking ahead, how can we help? How can we move this ball down the field and play that role? So what I'm going to do now is hand it over to Amy, who is one of the machine learning experts, uh, Amy McGovern. And do you have, do I change the slides for you, Amy? Uh, whoever has control of the slides, yes, please. <laughs> okay, I did it. Okay, Amy. Please. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're really glad you're here, and we're. I thank you, Brad, for everything you said to introduce. We're gonna. Uh, Brad and Libby and I are all gonna take turns getting you ready for today. So looking at this slide, what what I wanted to say. One of the things we've heard as a as a criticism of you know I think that. You're hearing all the things about AI is amazing and AI is great and you're seeing all these papers, but I think people sometimes think that maybe it's just a flash in the pan and it's the hot thing that's coming, but it's going to go away. And that might be because if you're old enough to remember there have been some AI upticks in the past that were followed by what they called by AI winter, but that is not the case right now. AI has really changed in the last 10 years such that it is not going away anytime soon. So this is just a figure to show publications in AI. Focusing in meteorology, this is an updated figure that came from a tutorial that um, I'm a co-author on from my former postdoc, Randy Chase. Um, and he updated this figure to include all the way through last year. Um, and you can see the blue line is the machine learning or the AI publications. And this is coming from uh, Web of Science. And then the red line is just for comparison to show all the publications in severe weather. And then the total number of meteorology papers at the top there, because the scale is so different, we put it on a different graph. And you can see the total number of meteorology papers are going up, but they're not going up at the rate that AI is going up. And this is just searching for AI machine learning in abstracts and titles of papers in the web of science. And they're going up tremendously. And then you can see on the right-hand graph what's driving all of this. And that is that it's the deep learning revolution. So we're searching for the words deep learning and neural nets in the, in the publications there. And that's, that's what's really driving that dramatic increase in papers. Next slide, whoever has the slide control. So I liked this, um, there was a, a talk in uh, the UK this year that had this article that came out called the quiet AI revolution of weather forecasting. And I think that the reason that it's quiet is if you're not paying attention, it's been happening in papers. Now, those who are paying attention, these papers are hitting archive, they're hitting this peer-reviewed literature, but they're hitting archive first, generally. And they're coming out at a rapid speed. I mean, it's almost one every week at this point and changing the world dramatically. But I think that if you weren't paying attention, you might not necessarily see that this is happening in the background. And there really is a huge revolution in AI for weather forecasting. So in the last uh, six to eight months, we've had private industry providers who have who've completely been able to surpass the uh, skill rate of the, the existing uh, NWP models for certain variables, not for everything. I'll get to that on the next slide. 
Um, but there, it is giving us a lot of hope that there's going to be an AI based solely, solely AI, not just a hybrid model, but a solely AI solution that's going to be able to do skillful forecasting for a wide range of impacts. Um, and so I just showed a couple of examples there on the left. We will jump to the next slide. Okay, so the next slide is looking at the forecast, the, the skill, um, this is uh, data provided by Weatherbench 2, which is a benchmark system that's out there that's provided by, do by Google. And looking at as these papers are starting to come out. So if you look at the lower left is the axis on the, the y X axis is time. The lower left there is January, 2019. January, 2023 is over there on the right. And then we're looking at skill relative to the IFS, to their HRES product. And so anything below, I, I don't have a mouse. So if I was there, I'd have a laser pointer, but you can see the hundred line. Anything below that hundred line is right, you know, it's just proof of concept. And here are all these things that were coming out. And then all of a sudden, starting in January, 2023, we started to cross the uh, hundred line. And so what you can see is that, you know, there were these ideas that were coming out and they were showing lots of interesting skill, but still not doing as well as IFS. And all of a sudden now we're doing better than IFS. Um, and the real question, I, I grabbed this graph and then I have a big red question mark up there is, you know, this looks like a linear graph, like we're just going up and we're going gangbusters. There's a real question there, what's going to happen? How much better can we get than IFS? And is there a, a point where we're going to have to start leveling off? I assume so. Um, but, you know, what does that look like, right? It's not all just dependent on the hardware getting better and better, because if you look at that, that provides eventually a challenge. Eventually we're getting, you know, hardware's pushing the limits of things that can be done physically. So it can't all rely on making these weather models better by making better GPUs come all the time. Although I, I'm sure there are more amazing GPUs that are coming out. But what what is our limit of predictability? What can we do with AI and what do we need to do to adjust the AI to make sure that it remains trustworthy, which is one of the themes of what we're gonna talk about today. Um, next slide. So, a question that you'll, or a theme that you will see today is trustworthy AI. And why do we care about trustworthy AI? We really want to enable the US leadership in AI. That is the title of the, the whole session today. But a lot of the questions we asked the panelists were about trustworthy AI. And those who know me know that I talk about trustworthy AI all the time because I am doing that for our NSF AI Institute. But I think we care about trustworthy AI deeply across AI for all applications. And so I grabbed some graphics here, in particular from some of the uh, legislation that's coming out, focusing on AI before we even get to weather. So the graphic here on the left is the risk pyramid from the EU AI Act. And so EU has a uh, brand new legislation out that is legislating AI and they've broken what they're doing with their legislation into these different risk categories. There's unacceptable risk, high risk, limited risk, and minimal risk. And for the unacceptable risk, they're not even gonna allow AI to be used. And they have, if you're interested in learning more, they have some extensive websites that define what the risk categories are. I just finished teaching an AI ethics class and we dove deeply into this AI act. Um, they also have uh, good examples of what the high risk categories are and the limited risk and minimal risk. But I think it's really interesting to see that the governments are getting out there and, and regulating this and saying that there are categories that we just are not going to accept from AI. It's really, really clear that we need AI to be trustworthy and, and we need it to be working across a wide variety of applications. So that also brings us to that, um, the website, that uh, screenshot in the upper right on this slide feeling like I really want to be able to point. Um, the screenshot in the upper right on this slide is from the EU AI Act. And then the United States is working on these things as well. So the United States doesn't have a comparable act yet to the EU AI Act, but we have an executive order that came out that is on safe, secure, and trustworthy development and use of AI. And I'm sure many of you have seen this executive order. It is the longest executive order I've ever seen. It is huge. And it mandated a whole bunch of agencies to do analysis of what's going on inside their, their agencies on AI. And then the White House has also put out a blueprint for the AI Bill of Rights. So they're focusing on this need for trustworthy AI as well. And then if you look inside Congress, they're working on a variety of, of uh, acts that, that will hopefully become similar to the EU AI Act. Um, but they will be different because our government is different than, than EU. We're not just trying to mimic them. Um, and then finally, in interesting news along those lines, um, the United Nations adopted a resolution on AI that the United States proposed, and it was adopted unanimously. Now, um, you can go read that one. It's a lot shorter than the 170-something pages of the executive order, and it's pretty interesting. And I will go to the next slide. So just um, before I switch over to Libby, um, I just want to point out that 
you know, you read these things and you read a lot about the trustworthy AI. If you go deep, dive deeply into the EU AI Act, for example, you come out with the thought of all these ways in which AI could go wrong, but none of them talk about weather and climate. And I think it's because it's not necessarily as obvious to people how AI needs to be trustworthy for weather and climate. And so I'm not um, up here just to go tell you to read my paper, but I happen to have a paper on it that is uh, uh, my paper work from AI from people in AITBS about ways in which AI can go wrong for environmental sciences. And it's just a quick, easy read to tell you all the ways in which AI, not all, it's a non-exhaustive list of the ways in which AI could go wrong if you weren't thinking about developing it in an ethical and responsible manner. And in particular, there are a huge variety of negative impacts that we could have, including having the AI models be wrong, having your AI data be biased and so your AI models are highly biased. But something that I don't think we talk about enough can be also related to the workforce and society where we might uh, stymie the burgeoning efforts in new countries that are trying to work on their own AI models. And we might be disenfranchising the scientists if we're, we're just having the AI do everything, et cetera. And finally, the, the lack of, or the, the uh, impact of AI itself on computing because it's very computing intensive, which means more power, which means more CO2 emissions. The downstream consequences of what we're doing in AI for weather are, are significant and we need to pay attention to them. And I think with that, I turn it over to Libby. Great, okay, so just to summarize um, the types of topics we're gonna to hear about today. So here are some of the relevant topics that we are going to hear about in terms of trustworthy AI for weather forecasting. First, thinking about the data, existing and emerging needs. Not only how do we make use of the data we already have, much of which has never been touched before, but what new data might we need? Um, thinking about the actual prediction and training tasks at hand. So what, what, it, is, what it is we might want um, AI to be predicting in the first place. Um, also infrastructure, uh, there's a lot of discussion right now is even if everybody agrees, there are storage and computing needs that are massive when run at this scale. Um, are, are we in a place to, to um, support the AI applications that we want to have. Furthermore, thinking about that um, infrastructure is certainly a piece of this, but thinking about the deployment. As Brad said, you can't just change your forecasting system overnight. And this is a major issue in terms of how and to what extent do you integrate it into existing systems or completely overhaul um, the, system that, the systems that we currently have. Another big part of, of trustworthiness, and you know, as Amy brought up, is assessment and validation. Um, we're going to hear a discussion about how do we continually assess and understand the ability of the, these tools to do what we're asking them to do. Um, and this is you know, a, a, a feedback loop. Uh, this is not a one and done kind of scenario. And then integration with the forecasts, the forecasters, and the users. Um, and this feeds nicely also into this idea of you can build something that's trustworthy, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's trusted. To do that, humans are absolutely involved, right? How people, um, each individual interacts with these AI tools as forecasts um, or as an additional, you know, uh, an additional model to integrate into their forecasts and their, um, whether they're forecasters or all the way downstream end users. And I do want to point out, you might be looking at this list and saying, well, you're missing a bunch of things, including something near and dear to my heart, which is scientific discovery. And we could have a week, weeks long sessions on this topic. And so we've really tried to be um, targeted in, in the topics we're discussing today. Um, and so I just want to note, this is not a, an accidental omission, um, but one that hopefully we can save for another day. Okay, next slide. So final slide here. Um, so that leads us to our panelists who are really the stars of the show today. Um, we are, we're really looking for, for folks who could speak about cooperation across agencies and sectors, including the government, academia, um, private industry, to really further US leadership in AI for, for weather and weather forecasting. And again, understanding, creating, and deploying trustworthy AI. And as you will note, I'm particularly excited about the diverse set of expertise that we have invited to speak today. This is not just one type of technical issue, but as we just discussed, trustworthy, tr building trustworthy AI, having trust, integrating um, these tools into our current systems or building new ones will require a wide range of expertise. And um, we're, we're hoping to hear from at least a, a sampling of that, of, of, of what's required. 
So I'm really excited and I wanna once again, thank the panelists for, for agreeing to come today to do this. All right, and then last slide here before I hand it back, I believe to Mary, it's just the, the agenda. Um, so I'll just mention we've split the day up into three sessions. Uh, the first focusing on opportunities for federal leadership, which we will start momentarily, then a lunch break. Um, session two is gonna be looking at developing trustworthy AI um, weather forecast for end users. And we split that actually into two to have a, a single panel fo focused on utilizing these tools. And then a second one focusing on the trust specifically for AI in weather forecasts. And then after a break, we will, we will finish with our final session um, on novel partnerships we will, where we will hear from um, partners across a range of institutions and, and organizations. So with that, I will hand it over to Mary to start the first session. Thank you. Thanks so much, <clears throat> Brad, Libby, and Amy. Um, so we wanna jump right into this first session and I'll invite our uh, federal leaders to join me up here at the, um, at the table um, <clears throat> for this panel discussion. Our format here is to have uh, about eight to 10 minutes of, um, yeah, please come up. Eight to 10 minutes, um, the speakers will take for their remarks and then we'll do a follow-up Q&A as part of that. And <clears throat> up first is Dr. Sangar Lee, and he is the uh, Weather Focus Area Lead Program Scientist and Scientific Computing Portfolio Manager for NASA's um, Science Mission Directorate. And you're welcome to use the um, podium. Yeah, thank you. So, Dr. Lee. All right, thank you very much. Um, it's my honor to come up here and uh, talk about what we are doing in, uh, in this uh, very exciting and, uh, and also very confusing time. As uh, I think uh, Libby talked about or, or Amy talked about that uh, we almost have um, like one paper every day uh, in archives and talking about weather forecasts and you know, the new AI model can do A, B, C, and D and it's just that incredible, it's hard to catch up. Um, I wanted to talk very quickly about what NASA is doing um, in terms of uh, AI broadly, AI and data science broadly, and then get into some of the uh, more detailed uh, what uh, the weather area that we are doing uh, more specifically, uh, you know, some of the re uh, recent efforts. So um, NASA um, science mission, uh, specifically science mission, um, Current, uh, recently created a, a new position, uh, NASA Chief Science Data Officer. And uh, this office um, starting to, to uh, fund some of the uh, uh, issues, uh, top issues uh, like AI, um, trustworthy, ethical AI, trustworthiness uh, AI, uh, some of those things and uh, open data um, and uh, trying to push uh, open uh, the data into the cloud uh, using cloud computing uh, for, for uh, our observations. And um, recently start funding some of the geospatial foundation models. We have a lot of uh, observation, uh, modus observation a lens service and uh, and lens set, um, so we have those uh, foundation foundation model for for images, and then recently get into some of the large language la large language model and um, geospatial foundation model, uh, in, including weather forecast. Um, weather fo focus areas certainly supporting that office. Um, and uh, we created some of the work. Um, so um, in terms of uh, NASA Earth Science, we have a technology office called AIST, uh, Earth, uh, Earth Science uh, Technology Office. 
and that office is funding some of the AI work. Uh, recent uh, call include uh, uh, digital twins development, some of the analytics in the cloud. Um, so um, I wanted to say, besides that technology call by uh, Earth Science Technology Office, uh, our research program doesn't have a, um, a specific uh, dedicated AI machine learning uh, type of call. We have many other uh, discipline uh, research calls out there and the recent experience, anecdotal um, experience is uh, about more than 50% of the projects come in, uh, proposals come in with say at least a uh, AI machine learning task. And we funded many of them. Um, so um, our internal belief is uh, in terms of uh, uh, PI level projects, we uh, we are you know it's well covered. We have uh, a lot of uh, you know uh, calls out there, and um, people can write proposals and can you know embed you know when when they're when they see fit, right? Um, however, uh, it's our thinking that the to tackle the, in the industrial level, like the large language model that Google is doing or uh, NVIDIA is doing, that we don't have that kind of a big core funding to support that kind of a project. So our uh, the weather focus area starting to move into that intermediary area. Can we fund some, some projects out there that require um, a uh, kind of a, a team of people tech, you know, working together, tackling the uh, machine, learning, a, machine learning AI foundation model. And we can put together resource to support that kind of a project. So lately we've been working on, we have been working on the uh, foundation model, uh, weather and climate foundation model and um, starting, you know, like Amy showed that uh, curve that uh, we are, you know, our NASA's focus is not to, to uh, beat uh, ECMWF. You know, we don't, uh, we don't do operational forecast. However, we see uh, a credible uh, weather model is a, a necessary condition when we move on to some of the downstream tasks. That downstream tasks, including some of the climate projection, uh, synthesizing of, of our observations, uh, ocean, um, ocean uh, connection with the ocean, the flux, and, and, and the, uh, the interchange between ocean and atmosphere, and some of the uh, subseasonal to seasonal forecast, that kind of a time scale using our uh, models. Um, so lately, um, I think uh, this, uh, uh, we were asked about to make some comment about uh, infrastructure and the, uh, the in, uh, kind of a, uh, uh, in, you know, some of the difficulty roadblocks. Uh, we are facing this very, very difficult decision. We have existing models, which those are tuned, uh, written for GPU kind of uh, processors. And if we are moving away, um, that the latest, uh, the new arch um, uh, computing architecture are all GPU um, you know, and CPU mix of uh, GPU, CPU. If we wanted to use that kind of architecture, we need to spend the time and energy, very, very extremely labor intensive uh, work to move on to GPU. Okay, here we go. Here will come the AI. AI requires uh, uh, GPUs. A lot of the model that uses GPU. So we need to 
buy more GPU, right? So every dollar we move from CPU to GPU becomes some, you know, some uh, difficulty for our existing work, the traditional uh, physics-based model uh, running on CPUs. So that's a very difficult, extremely difficult decision. But when we, when more and more people get into to GPU doing AI uh, machine learning model, we are facing that kind of a trade off and, and, and that's a kind of a, uh, we, you know, we need some, some advanced planning to do that, to, to think about those. Um, of course, uh, we need a software stack. We need some uh, very um, uh, well curated software stack. You know, not not every uh, AI model is created uh, equal. Uh, we need now uh, NASA is thinking about kind of a uh, at least some measurement about uh, how mature, how uh, whether or not the software is will uh, will is ready for our work, and um, we need to um, you know define some of the best practice and how. Uh, to provide some guide guideline and and uh, to the uh, to our users how to best uh, proposing uh, the uh, machine learning AI kind of a task, some kind of a measurement, performance measurement, some kind of a, a benchmark. Um, those are the think you know, our current thinking. Um, and finally. I think there's uh, still a lack of uh, existing expertise when it comes to the proposal evaluation. Uh, we have people, domain scientists, and uh, very well prepared to do that, but uh, uh, still some, you know, when it comes to AI machine learning, still we are still climbing the learning curve, and that's uh, a little difficult. So with that. Okay. Uh Thank you, Sunger. Uh, feel free to stay at the podium okay. or join us at the table, um, but I'll remind everybody to put questions into Slido or upvote the comments that are, or that are there already. Um, and I want to start, I think, with the first question here. And that's a, um, a request for you to talk a little bit about more about weather and climate foundational models at NASA. Mm -hmm. um, and is that, you know, because the continuum, I think, is important there. And um, how, how do you see them moving together? Is that, yeah. is there a coordinated yeah. approach? There? As I said, the, um, you know, we believe uh, weather um, is a necessary condition for, for our work, All right? So we need to, um, build weather foundation model first mm -hmm. before we move on to climate. And the, when it comes to climate, the ensemble uh, forecast is in, extremely important. And I think we need, uh, when, when we build up our system with uh, uh, weather, um, which is ongoing and, uh, um, and we evaluate the model uh, when it's, uh, uh, mature enough, we move on to couple model and more uh, uh, ensemble forecast mm -hmm. type of uh, application. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> another question here is, um, I keep losing them, is the one thing about Slido is it keeps updating here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what makes an AI weather model foundational in your mind? Is it a priority, you know. Has... In my mind, yeah, in my mind, foundation model basically is a, a kind of a kitchen sink approach. You throw a lot of information in there. So it can do uh, a lot of different things uh, downstream. So in my mind, the critical thing is to be able to do various different tasks. Uh, we, we are doing... Um, you know, uh, downscaling. We are doing the uh, the uh, clear, uh, for aeronautic uh, you know, turbulence uh, in the air, and uh, we are uh, for our PBL planetary boundary layer 
Now we are doing some of the boundary layer research. So those are the very different tasks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I haven't typed this into Slido, but I'd like to ask. So NASA has incredible data holdings, you yes. know, when you come to AI. And um, have you been looking at that with respect to what are gonna be the requirements for AI to be kind of accessing that data? You know, I think, I hear from my colleagues that work in this is the, the yeah. data is a real challenge sometimes. Yes, yes. Um, so uh, you might notice that the, the weather forca forecast model currently are all trained with um, reanalysis data. And that's uh, basically a taking an easy step forward, right? Uh, dealing with observations is a lot more difficult. It's my personal belief that the next 12 months will be very exciting uh, when we move toward you know, taking observations into machine learning AI. Um, and that's, you know, we will, we, we are, you know, I, I think it will happen very quickly. The uh, convergence of uh, data assimilation with, uh, with AI and we, I think next year by by the AMS time we we'll, we should be able to see a lot of uh, very exciting you know, okay. papers. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I want to mention a couple of questions here that I think might have been you know from our introductory session, but I'll give you first cut at them. Um, and the first question is, how do you define trustworthy? You know, how are we approaching this as really having guidelines to uh, achieve trustworthiness? So don't feel obligated for you to take that one on yes. if you have any so, comments. So I don't have a lot of experience in that topic, um, but I do have uh, recently about um, talking about that ensemble forecast, right? Mm -hmm. How do we communicate with the users and when we have a distribution of forecasts and how, what kind of message, how, you know, it, we can we cannot just provide the uh, ensemble mean, and the user needs to know when they use certain kind of information, uh, what kind of a risk uh, are there? Um, you know, so so that that's uh, I think a, a very recent example that uh, you know that I have encountered, and we have a huge debate you know within. NASA uh, program management staffs and talking about, yeah, we have, you know, forecasts out there and, you know, how do we come, how do we do this kind of a uh, communication, mm -hmm. right? Um, let me, if I may, just ask if Amy or Olivia or anybody wants to comment on this question about, you know, what is really defining trustworthiness or whether you think this will be addressed more as we go through the day. Actually, Libby and I are running a notes document and we're just talking about this. And we were hoping that you would ask this question of all of your panelists. Yeah. Because that's, I think that getting the answer from everybody is what we were talking about at the end of the slide. So hearing the diversity of opinions is going to be really interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, just checking here again. Um, how can we get AI models to work beyond the data they were trained on? For example, like rare events such as flash flooding and with a return frequency of one in a hundred years in arid, semi-arid regions. That's a very, very <laughs> interesting, good question. A good question. All right, so uh, as I mentioned that uh, the current uh, training, uh, most of our weather uh, model AI model training are done with uh, uh, reanalysis, mm -hmm. um, and it's being recognized that reanal reanalysis is very smooth, and the model can uh, you know AI model can easily do do overfitting to that to that uh, uh, reanalysis data. Mm -hmm. So, but. There's, there are several techniques uh, that I uh, recently encountered, you know, uh, I've seen. Uh, people are 
perturbing the initial condition and get to the ensemble and that actually get to three or four sigma out there, the extreme events. Mm -hmm. So using AI to do ensemble forecast is really, really fascinating. Uh, in the past, we can do you know, ensemble forecast, we can do eight member, 10 member, 30 member. Now we are talking about 7,000 uh, ensemble members, literally cover the entire spectrum. And there, there's some uh, theory actually uh, developed, you know, understanding that that's, that's good enough coverage. Um, and we have seen that, uh, you know, ac actually capture that extreme events. Mm -hmm. So that's really fascinating. You now this is yeah. very moving very fast. Every week uh, there's a new paper yeah. coming out. It's pretty exciting. Okay, yeah. I think we'll leave it uh, there and move on. To, so thank you and right. please, please join us here um, and move on to um, Dr. Gary Gerenhart. And Gary is the director of the Earth and Environmental System Science Division in the Office of Biological and Environmental Research at Department of Energy. And Gary's online today. Gary? Okay. Can you, everybody see me and hear me? Yes. Okay, yes. perfect. So thanks. I wish I was there in person. And it's nice seeing uh, Sangar as a guinea pig. So at least I know what to expect in this. So thanks, Sangar, for that. So just a, some opening comments. I just wanted to mention the DOE has been investing a lot in uh, AI and machine learning for perhaps a decade. It really spun up in the past few years, but I think the most of the investment has been on the uh, computational side, the Advanced Scientific Computing Research Office, but we're the domain area for weather and climate. Uh, we don't invest so much in weather, but as Sangar pointed out, it's hard to separate weather and climate when you're doing, uh, when you're using AI. So uh, in the past, we, we had investments in AI in two areas going back about 10 years ago. The first one was a Berkeley lab and they were focusing on extreme events. Um, the other was within our ARM facility. We've been using AI for a long time in the ARM facility just on, let's say, data processing, um, and the other area is they've been using it even for pointing radars with uh, uh, within some of the field campaigns as they did in Houston a few years ago. Back around 2019, we organized a, a big workshop that was conducted in 2020 and 2021 that was called AI for ESP. I think a lot of people on this call were part of that. It started out uh, quite broad, uh, we were exploring ways to, ex, you know, take advantage of AI methodologies for our research within climate, especially. And um, that particular workshop was based upon some ideas that we solicited from, especially the lab community. We received 150 what I called idea papers, which spanned weather forecasting to climate initialization. Uh, impacts areas such as the, electric, the electrical grid, um, infrastructure, roll, you know, all the way across the board. And we use that to at least frame, I think it was 16 or 17 sessions as part of that workshop extended over uh, a number of months. We've been using AI in, I would say, all of our programs ever since then. So the intent was that the AI for ESP workshop would become a source for ideas for our lab investments and some of our funding opportunities to universities to uh, incorporate AI where it's appropriate in the kind of research they're doing. Um, in 2023, this is last year, we asked our climate modeling team, this is the E3SM team, to, considering, to consider adding AI to their, their next three-year plan, which they did. They're in the first phase of that plan and they're looking at AI uh, for things like initialization, some of the parameterizations, um, but it, it goes on, but it, it extended also into the impact sectors because that's also part of uh, E3SM. So uh, we're calling this kind of like a hybrid 
model of sorts, but it's but the intent is not to use AI to improve just the predictions or the projections of the climate, but also as a guide to the to the uh, to the physics based approach so we can figure out how do we catch up with the physics based upon what AI can do. So a few updates recently, and that's NVIDIA. I think you know that we have uh, our models ported to the exaflop machines at Argonne and um, Oak Ridge, as well as Berkeley. But I think it shook up the community when NVIDIA announced that they're going to uh, build a 33 exaflop computer. Um, and we're kind of wondering how to react to that because that of course is going to be driving the next generation of AI. And we don't want to be left behind, but at the same time, uh, it is going to revolutionize the community. So I think the uh, some of the I think you asked three questions and what is what is DOE's approach to AI and I think we're focusing especially on climate but we're thinking about the not just the S to S but the shorter time scales going getting down to ten days because that's almost a no man's land. Uh, we need a hard discussion how to do that but but our emphasis within Office of Science really is on the climate time scales even though the applied offices such as EERE uh, has expressed interest in getting into the weather timescales. Um, one challenge I see, and Sengar was kind of hinting at this, and that is that the field is moving extremely fast. It's hard to keep up. And I know that uh, several of our labs have uh, established uh, collaborations with uh, uh, different vendors, Berkeley, for example, has Berkeley Lab, for example, has been. Uh, I think they have an agreement with Nvidia uh, to at least uh, collaborate in, in different ways. Um, and also the applications, we're looking at not just climate projections or how weather and climate interact, but also looking at the extreme phenomena and how one can improve the representations of those on the impact sectors that DOE's most interested in. Uh, I think your second question focused on resources. And uh, of course we do have exaflop computing, but it doesn't mean it's dedicated to us. We have to compete for resources. Um, and uh, I mean, we've, we've been fortunate so far, but there's a lot of competition across DOE to get gain access to these exaflop computers that are designed more for uh, AI, but uh, I would say that is a challenge. The other big challenge we're facing is uh, uh, workforce, uh, especially retention, because uh, the big labs that are really deep into the AI space, and this is Berkeley Lab, Argonne, Oak Ridge, those that have exaflop uh, computers, but the it's getting increasingly hard to keep the staff working on problems when they're uh, when they can get offers that double or triple what they're making uh, today. Um, in the third area, third question, I think it's partnerships across the federal government. Um, we have been uh, on some several working groups within ICAMS and also USGCRP where AI comes up a lot. We do recognize NASA as a major leader in this. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I'm not there next to you, Sundar, but um, we do acknowledge you. Also, NSF is has a big role with academia, and of course, we're we are closely watching what the vendors are doing, uh, such as Nvidia, because it's um, something which is creating a paradigm shift, and we're not quite sure how it's going to play out in the future. I think I'll just stop there and kind of open it up for any comments or questions. I'll just follow up on that last point, because um, Sangar mentioned this too, that we really have a challenge in our field because we've been so CPU based and that's not the, where the world is going. Um, what is the discussion around that in DOE um, with your you know, large investments in computers and modeling? Well, I think, you know, the exaflop computers are designed around GPU. So we, we've rewritten our climate code uh, in GPU, so we can we can easily that that to those machines. Okay. okay, so you've gone over the bridge already. Okay. Yeah, it was a major investment, but it was worth it in the end. Just out of curiosity, are we talking about years there for getting that done? Or, well, we 
we started the project a decade ago, but we didn't start really aggressively to shift the software G towards GPU until say three or four years ago. But that was kind of built along with the normal advances in in computing in general. I mean, it, let's say we're focusing on the science and software at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, well, I see Amy has her hand up. I was about to ask the trustworthy question, but Amy? <laughs> you can ask him the trustworthy question, but I was gonna ask another question that came from his comments. Um, and that, that is that you, you said something about how it was hard to keep up, which I think all of us agree with. I know that was me who said that in the beginning. And a question for you as a federal funding agency is how do you help the academics keep up, especially given that the review cycle, you know, you have to put out a call for proposals, you have to go through the review cycle, you have to wait for the money to get awarded, then they have to get hiring. And it feels like the world has dramatically changed in that time. Yeah, you're asking a tough question. Uh, well, for, first of all, some of our funding opportunities have specified that we want the academic community to incorporate AI. Uh, now, not all of them are doing that, but we're, we're increasingly moving in that direction. Some of our funding opportunities allow for partnerships with our national labs, where they have a lot of this expertise. And that's probably one of the ways to get the universities to at least catch up in a way, because not all universities are the same and not all of them put the same weight on AI for the weather and climate sciences. Um, and I would almost put this back to um, maybe NSF because they have strong influence over uh, the academic sector. How do we um, increase their capacity, increase the academic capacity broadly? And it's a challenge. It, it's, I think academia is facing the same situation the DOE labs are, and that is recruiting and retaining people. Um, I think the DOE labs have a bit of an advantage because they can offer higher salaries because they're private sector labs. But at the same, I, I don't have a good answer. I'm sorry about that. But thanks, Amy. I knew it was a hard one. I just wanted yeah. to hear what you, you thought about it. And I agree, academia is having the exact same workforce retention problems. Yeah. Um, so let me shift to that trustworthy question and see what your um, uh, what the discussion around that is. You know what that means at DOE. This aspect of trustworthy AI. Well, we do have that discussion. We're we're careful not to uh, believe that AI is going to be the solution to everything. It's one of the uh, tools that one applies to analysis. So we're not going to blindly assume that just because it's an AI prediction is going to be the most accurate prediction. So we're very careful on how we advertise the results if it comes, comes from AI. I can't say much more than that or what or what Sangar has also said, but we, we take a cautionary approach. I'll, I'll just say that. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, let me see. Uh, again, people can put questions into Slido. Um, Libby had her hand up a minute ago. Okay, we are trying to get everybody on Slido, but go ahead, Libby. Oh no, it's okay, Mary, I took it down. You're all good. Let's get other people. Okay. Um, so here's a question. I'm hearing several pain points of trying to keep up with private industry. Um, what pathways could accelerate uh, public-private partnerships and what policy um, might help, you know, what congressional policy might help with that? Hmm. Well, As you, you, see, you have a bit of advantage with your labs and yeah. much more freedom, yeah. Yeah, I think the, the idea of partnerships just so we have access to what's coming down the pipeline would be really useful. I, I think what's, what it's been like over the past several years is that we get surprised by private industry, how far ahead they might be. But I think the more we put weight on uh, not just coordination, but some collaborative opportunities with the private sector uh, where they can contribute to either training or um, this might be university training, might be just uh, working with our, our labs. Mm -hmm. Right. Again, it's not an easy question to answer, but it's, it's, it's an important question. Yes, and it's it goes beyond AI as well, this question of partnerships overall. Thank you. Okay, um, 
So we'll have time at the end, I think, for a few questions with the whole panel. Why don't we move forward here? And I think Eric's in the audience here. We're going to hear next uh, from doc Dr. Eric DeWeaver from National Science Foundation. And Eric is the, sorry, let me get this up here. I don't want to get your title right. Um, Eric is the program director for the NSF Climate and Large Scale Dynamics Program. Eric? Uh, well, thank you, Mary, and uh, really nice to have the opportunity to, to be here with you today and represent the Nas National Science Foundation. Um, you know, the, the, the topic on the table is, um, you know, uh, leadership in AI for weather and climate. Um, you know, and I think it's worth considering kind of at the outset that, uh, you know, there's different kinds of leadership. The National Science Foundation uh, is, was established to, to, to support basic science research in the United States. Um, and leadership uh, in, in basic science is going to be the goal of the agency. You know, and I think there's a long conversation to be had about how leadership in basic science relates to leadership uh, in operational weather prediction and other operational tasks, because uh, the relationship between these two is indirect. Um, and I think that's you know, there's a whole conversation to be had about that, which I think goes well beyond uh, AI. You can certainly be a leader in one aspect and not the other. Um, but just in terms of, you know, what, what does it mean to us um, to establish uh, leadership? Um, you know, for us, I think the question is going to be, you know, what research should we be funding and what vehicles and mechanisms should we be used to fund it? And I think, uh, you know, we've heard from Sengdar, we've heard from, from Gary, I think that, um, you know, we're still kind of in the early stages of understanding, you know, what is really the basic science research uh, that's, that, that, that's, you know, appropriate in the context of, of artificial intelligence, and particularly in terms of weather and climate. Um, you know, so we're still thinking about what those questions are. I mean, I could list a few that sort of make sense to me and that you hear discussed, um, you know, questions to do with how do these systems actually work? You know, what's in that black box? You know, the fancy way of saying it, I think, is what's going on in latent space of one of these machine learning systems when it's making a weather forecast. This is a dynamical system. It time marches. You can look at it using dynamical systems theory. You can, I think, ask really interesting questions that relate to the physical system itself. Really that, you know, when you're looking at a weather forecast model and it has something like, you know, um, a billion degrees of freedom or something like that, the, the behaviors that you're capturing are emergent behaviors for which the dimensionality is much less. And what these emergent behaviors are has always been fundamentally the topic of the research world. Um, now it looks like we have another way of getting at these emergent behaviors, you know, because it's surprisingly the case that um, you can make these weather, not only that you can make um, excellent forecasts this way, but that you only need 50 years of data to train these systems. I would never have guessed that 50 years is enough, you know? Um, and so certainly there's behaviors uh, that, 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 that can be explored by looking at what's going on in latent space. Um, another one, uh, you know, is stability. You know, it's, a ner it's the stability is, is an issue, practically speaking, for the application of these things. It's also a really interesting question. What does it tell you about the physical system? Um, how should we be doing stability analysis on these things? Again, this is a very fast moving thing. Um, can we trust the extremes? We've already heard two people talking about this. You know, it would be great if we could make, you know, we can make one of these forecasts in a, in a what, a, a one ten thousandth of a second, I think is what it takes to do one of these five year forecasts. So that means we could have an ensemble of 10,000 in a second, right? Well, what? What would you take home and trust from the extremes of that ensemble? You know, I think there's a lot of uh, theorems to be proved about, you know, what are the right expectations to have about, you know, what goes on in the tails of the distributions of these things and to what extent that those tails match the tails that you would get from a first principle system. Um, you know, another thing that I think is worth considering is that much of what we're talking about here, what really falls in the subcategory of emulators Right. And the thing about emulators is that they're quick and dirty. They're really, really quick. So the question now becomes, what are you going to do with the opportunity space that's opened up just by virtue of being able to do certain things, you know, a million times, 10, 100 million times faster than you used to be able to? One of these, and we're exploring this in our uh, investments in Tapio Schneider's Klima project, is parameter space. 
you know, how does the climate that you simulate, how does the sensitivity of that climate, how does the behavior of that climate depend on the parameter choices that you make uh, when you tune the climate to mat of the climate of that model to match the present day climate? You know, if your way of tuning climates is to do it manually, you know, and it takes a year or so just to tune a handful of parameters, you'll never be able to get at that question. If you could do automate this using emulators to speed up the physics, you can actually explore that question. The equivalent question in biology is what is the relationship between the genome and the phenome, right? And once you start getting into that, you know, then you say, okay, these are the parameter tuning sets that work. Which of these are righteous in the eyes of the satellite data that we have, which is data about microphysics, you know, Calypso, cloud set, things like that, you know. Um, and now you can start to ask questions about the behavior of the model, not only on the macroscopic scale, we've been doing all along, but also on the microscopic scale. Could be that some of those parameter settings that work just, just as well for the macro scale don't match at all the data that we have about things like cloud microphysics that you can get from satellites. Right now, there's a tremendous amount of satellite data that's not really used because we don't know how to use it. You know, so these are tools that you can use to really exploit the resources that you've already spent billions of dollars accumulating over time. You know, so these are the exciting kinds of things that we see um, as the opportunity space of this. Um, and, uh, you know, speaking of emulators, emulators are a great way to get at these kinds of impact spaces and things like that. One of the great conversations I've ever had was with Baylor Fox Kemper after he was involved in the latest uh, working group one uh, report of the IPCC. Because what he said, and I heard this also from Kyle Armour who's working on that, is that the, the, the new thing in that report was the use of emulators to communicate between the, the chapter authors of the different chapters in it. You know, because if you ask, how is climate going to affect the ice sheets, which is a thing because it's an ice sheet chapter and it's a climate chapter, you know, you can't just hand them a morass of data about these are the different climate sensitivities and these are different global warming trends and this is a different Arctic amplification. It's much easier to do if you can make some spreadsheet size emulator where you can plug in all of the different things that have come out of this chapter on climate and directly apply them to the, to the, to the in this case, the application space of what happens to ice sheets, do we have to be worrying about ice sheet collapse, sea level rise, all of that kind of stuff. You know, and so that again is a space that I think the National Science Foundation ought to be exploring and, and, and these are things that we're thinking about. Um, so I'll jump ahead a little bit about this. You, if, if you think about one of the key challenges to how we're gonna support this, you know, one of them is what's the, I mean, the obvious one, right? What's the model? Right. Certainly we have Amy McGovern, we're funding AI2ES. So these are big projects. We have LEAP, the Center for Learning the Earth through Artificial Intelligence and Physics, which is doing some of these things with um, you know, climate model tuning, with looking at emulators, things like that. We have Tapio Schneider's project, which is kind of on the same order, except that most of their money actually comes from Schmidt Foundation. So there's a partnership example for you. Um, you know, but democratization is important. For all that we might like to play on this kind of macro scale of projects, the bread and butter of what we do is funding, you know, single PI type projects in academia through core programs. Um, and if you ask, what's the secret sauce of, of democratization? The answer is, I think, the facilities model. You have to take the resources that people need and package them in a such a way that they can become available to people without who don't belong to a big group you know, who haven't sort of keyed into these things in various ways. And I think that's a tremendous power that we have as an agency is to be able to do that. Um, so I'll talk about a couple of things that, um, that we're doing there. And one of them is we've just started a solicitation called Collaborations in Artificial Intelligence and Geoscience. So we now have the first, presumably, of a stack of proposals we'll be getting every year where people we're, encar we're encouraging proposals from, from, from groups, which basically include uh, one person who's a domain expert in the geosciences and one person who's a domain expert in some form of artificial intelligence, machine learning, those kinds of things, right? Um, we naively thought that we'd get about 60 proposals. We've gotten more than three times that many, right? Um, we really kind of, you know, um, um, opened the door, you know, it's a, the classic sort of thing where you open the, the closet door and out falls all the bowling balls and skis and all the other stuff that, that bonks you on the head. You know, we had no idea what the, 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 the sort of, you know, um, fire hose of, of, of interest that we were opening up. We did that. I don't know why we were surprised by that in retrospect, but we were. Um, and so I think having funding mechanisms on that scale, on the normal scale that people operate, is important. The other form of democratization I think we need to, to sort of think about is providing resources to people 
right? Um, so one of the things you may be, uh, that, that, that I think is interesting here is that uh, the White House invented this thing called the National Artificial Intelligence um, Research Resource, N-A-I-R-R. I actually have this in front of me because it's so dramatic. Within 90 days of the receipt of this or order, uh, the, the, the director of the National Science Foundation shall start this program. The program shall pursue infrastructure governance mechanisms, user interfaces to pilot an initial integration of distributed computational data, model and training resources to be made available to the research community. All that within 90 days, right? So we're working on it. I mean, you know, I think 90 days is aspirational, <laughs> Um, but there is now a pilot project. And I think we are, you know, the obvious thing that comes up when people start talking about this is com computing resources. Oh, I need a huge computer. The statistic that I have heard, and somebody can correct me, is that when NVIDIA trains its machine learning algorithm to emulate the ECMWF forecast, that costs about two and a half million dollars worth of compute resource every time you do that, right? And so the amount of compute resource that you need is tremendous, right? Um, and so, that will be the obvious thing is, oh, we need to put everything on the cloud. We need to do cloud this, cloud that, cloud that, you know, and that's something that, that, that certainly needs to be done. Um, but I would caution that it's not the only thing that needs to be done. I mean, one of the things that um, um, I think has, has been important in this space uh, is reanalysis data, you know? So this dramatically increases the value of reanalysis data. I think that's good for us. I think that's good for us as a science. You know, um, because you know now the reanalysis that ECMWF has is probably the most valuable thing that they have. You know, and so if in the future we be our task as scientists is to make better training sets for the AI, and then the AI can go off and do the forecast, and we can have ensemble forecasts, we can do a hundred, you know, ten thousand in the second, in the second, all this kind of stuff. Um, that gives us a role as scientists, which I think is a valued role. I think it also is a better fit to the way we work you know, the kind of behind the scenes work that, that, that NSF and, and other agencies are good at funding. Um, so I, I think I should stop here because I'm probably out of time, but um, I can go on and on. If, if, you know, I, I was gonna say, it's quite, <laughs> quite informative. There's, yeah. you know, it's great to hear uh, everything that NSF is taking on. And of course, as you mentioned, you know, you made some investments with the AI2ES, which mm -hmm. I think is, you know, that's bringing together not only academia, but private sector partners right. as well in that. It sounds right. like you'll be, you know, now you have these uh, collaborations with the domain expert and all. So you see those kind of moving forward in the future? Uh, um, in general, I do. I don't have any specifics on that. And I certainly wouldn't, would, would, would remind everyone that NSF has a new directorate, the Technology Innovation mm -hmm. Partnerships Directorate, uh, which is specifically looking for this kind of stuff and is making awards at the level of $20 million a year, which is not something that I think NSF has, has, has really done in the past other than perhaps uh, NCAR. And I think it's a really important question for academia. What happens to academia when NSF wants to work at that scale and wants to spend money in that way? Because this is not the traditional model of basic science funding that we've had. Um, the other thing I'll point out is, you know, when it comes to partnerships, you know, um, what has impressed me is the extent to which uh, the best partnerships that NSF has are the ones that came to us from our funded research community. You know, um, for example, you know, a lot of the work that's being done with NVIDIA, I find out about it last. You know, it doesn't rely on a memorandum of understanding between NSF and NVIDIA. You know, I'll point out, for instance, that Mike Pritchard was a funded NSF PI when he took an 80% appointment at NVIDIA. They gave him a lot of resources. Uh, he's also... Uh, on the leadership team of LEAP. You know, I didn't have anything to do with that. I mean, that wasn't something that happened because NSF wanted it to, but that positions LEAP in a very good way because NVIDIA has all of these resources. You know, meanwhile, um, Dale Duran now at University of Washington is, has been recruited by, um, by, by Mike. And, you know, um, that's good because he's retaining his professorship at the University of Washington. So we have these people who are volunteering to be these kinds of bridge people. The other thing I'll point out about Dale is that Dale has this model, right? He has a model that also emulates ECMWF. And as far as I can tell, it does pretty good. You know, the interesting thing there is that uh, the model that NVIDIA has, has something like 10 million degrees of freedom. Dale's model has something like a dozen, you know, and he can come within about a day of the skill score. 
you know, and so that's really important for academia. It doesn't take two and a half million dollars worth of compute resource to train Dale's model, you know, and so if I want to ask what's going on in the latent space, I'd much rather work with that model, you know, and think about all the opportunities that 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 opens up. One of the things they, they told me last time that he's, he, I saw him was that he'd managed to get that model to be stable, so we can run it for a year. That's the kind of model you want to fiddle around with when you're looking at stability. This is the basic science model. You know, and so in some ways, I think the fact that the community is ahead of us is something that we can use to our advantage. Um, one of the things you haven't talked a lot about, and there's a question here, is about um, NSF's perspective on workforce development in AI and weather applications. Whether, yeah, weather application. Yeah, I think that's important. And, you know, this is baked into, you know, the awards that we're making like AI2ES, LEAP as well, um, CAIG, you know, the proposals all have graduate students that they're training, we're mm -hmm. having this new way of training them and so on. Um, the National uh, Artificial Intelligence um, Research Resource, uh, certainly conversations going on around that are about education. Gary Gaynor is right, it's part of our mandate uh, and we're doing that. Um, um, I guess, you know, maybe one thing I could point out about this, because it's, there are experts on this, I think, and maybe Kevin Reed could, could, could help us with this. There's a new project called ClimbSim, which really interests me, uh, where, you know, again, this is an interesting example of partnership on its own. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the super parameterized version of CAM that was developed in the CMAP Science and Technology Center as an NSF project, uh, has been adopted uh, by DOE. They've made these simulations available um, to through a through a competition uh, mechanism, which I was unaware of. Uh, and there's now kind of a contest where anyone can go uh, and try to um, make the best possible emulator for the column physics of SPCAM uh, run in a few different configurations. Some are high res, some are low res, et cetera. Um, that's a way that I have never heard of before you know, where you take something that you're interested in and you just farm it out. You say, okay, there's all these people out there who know about how to make emulators and they're all getting their PhD in AI or some related thing. They're all looking for a project to work on. A lot of them are actually interested in climate. I mean, it's a problem of the day, you know, all of that. Um, so here's a way of reaching that massive audience, you know, a completely new way of organizing the labor of doing science and having a reward structure for it, you know, and so, you know, it's it's a tremendous accomplishment to me. You know, when you look at the at the paper that announces this and the GitHub website and so on and so forth, this what three dozen authors on this or five dozen authors on this. Some are NSF funded, some are DOE funded. Leap is is leading the charge on this. Mike Pritchard is there with Nvidia. You know, all of these things are happening on their own. You know, we just need to figure out how to feed the monster. You know, I mean, I think that's our task really. If we look at you know what's the most effective way for us to behave. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, well, I think we'll have a little bit of time at the end, but let me ask one final one when you're there, just to talk about trustworthiness a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, trustworthiness. So I don't see the specialness of trustworthiness um, in AI when it comes to science. I can understand certainly want to trust the forecast you have, so on and so forth. Um, but the fundamental question has always been, why trust a model? Right. I don't think it matters whether it's a machine learning model or whether it's a first principles model or whether it's, you know, just you with charts and graphs. You know, I think this trustworthiness issue, um, you know, when we think about it in the context of the science that we as NSF are funding, um, you know, I think this question uh, belongs in the category of questions that we as a basic science funding agency are, have always been tasked with asking. You know, when people make climate projections, I mean, most of the work that we fund in my program, I think, is fundamentally about this issue of why should we trust what a, what a, what a computer model of any kind tells us about what's going to happen 100 years from now. You know, and I think when you look at these interesting questions of should I trust the, 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 the extreme events that are generated by an ensemble of machine learned forecast models, you know, I think we kind of understand at a fundamental level that this is what we're supposed to be doing. This is the basic science aspect of it. Um, but I may be trivializing the question because it could be that people are thinking about other ethical dimensions of this besides kind of the why trust a model thing that I would go to. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you. Um, please join us here.
And um, now I'd like to introduce from NOAA, Dr. Isidore Yankov, who is the Deputy Chief of the Earth Prediction Advancement Division and Chief of Scientific Computing and Novel Architectures at NOAA. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. So I'll just add, I work at the NOAA Global Systems Laboratory in, in Boulder, which is more kind of research laboratory. Uh, well, where to start, all these previous panelists touched on basically everything that I'm going to talk about, just focus on the NOAA's perspective. So first I would like to start that NOAA Center for Artificial Intelligence reported that there are more than 200 different AI-based projects across NOAA. So that means across NOAA in different areas, but also different ways of approaching or using uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning algorithms. So today we are focusing more on the application in um, numerical weather predictions. So I guess the best way to summarize high level summary for, for today's purpose on where noise heading is for me to provide an overview of two very important meetings that took place in a relatively recent past. One being in late November last year, which is kind of ancient history for AI timescales. And one that just took place last week here in DC, which was um, a workshop organized, co-organized between OSTP and NOAA. So as Amy showed at the beginning of the diagram, like we were all taken back with the rapid development and new reality, and now seeing these data-driven models that are showing some promises and good performance. And at that point, we realized that NOAA just simply has to make a solid plan. Where do we fit? How do we adopt this new reality and what's, what's our role going to be? So in late November last year, several of us across NOAA and, and, and really it came out really great because we were all representing different line offices, research, NOAA research, National Weather Service program offices. We came together, organized this AI for NWP workshop with establishing like specific objectives. So some of them were that number one, we need to identify opportunities as well as barriers of introducing these models, data-driven models into existing NOAA research to operation pipeline, which is very specific and timelines are very well defined. And even more importantly is how do we uh, integrate this new approach into more traditional research and development that we already have at NOAA. The big thing was to identify key partners and finally to scope out how much, what resources will take to take this off the ground at NOAA. In terms, of, in terms of opportunities, we identified several of them, but the two most important ones, at least from my perspective, were ensembles, and we already heard about that. So ensemble part is a huge part of NOAA's both research as well as operational system. And then that occur as a, as a great opportunity to be able to produce 16,000 ensemble members in a few minutes and try to kind of fully reproduce the distribution of reality and, and figure out the tales and being able in that sense to improve both data simulation as well as forecasting aspects. Another opportunity we just we briefly discussed a few minutes ago is our role to be to, to basically be responsible for producing the best data sets for training. And that's that's where actually uh, expertise from um, domain experts can, can come in place and be extremely valuable. In terms of variables, there, there are many of them and some of them already been mentioned. I will, I will just add it from the NOAA's perspective. Well, big one, that research to operation pipeline that works for traditional models is just simply not going, would not work for these models. Particularly, we have like different readiness levels. So each model goes to, there are nine of them and 920 is the operational one. And there are specific timelines associated with them. It's just not going to work for data-driven models. So that's that's the big one. And then one that that we really touched on in our workshop last week and talked about a lot and goes to trustworthy part is obviously at NOAA, we have weather forecasters who are issuing forecasts and they are signing their names on the forecast, especially for high impact events. And Again, I think we, we worked a lot with uh, forecasters, including uh, uh, really social scientists, helping us how to communicate the uh, uh, probabilistic forecast, which goes to ensembles, because that 
that ad added a new level of complexity. Now we are talking about uh, convincing forecasters that there is value in data-driven models. And, you know, again, their, their, their reputation is at stake here when they sign these forecasts. So it was question, how do we, where is that trust? That trustworthiness for forecasters comes into place as the key element. So one of the options that we've discussed uh, is that basically, as we occasionally do at NOAA anyway, and when we have a new implementation of the operational model, we sometimes, if computational resources allow, we run in parallel the old version or the previous version, and then uh, uh, and the new at the same time. So that may be an option for forecasters to get more comfortable to mm -hmm. gain experience and adopt this new model in a find it trustworthy. Um, again, in terms of barriers, computational resources, again, everybody talked about that. For NOAA, it's, we find it and leading the computational, scientific computational branch. So we are actually exploring different hardware. So it's not just number of compute hours, it's access to the latest hardware to explore portabilities and uh, 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 testing code efficiencies. That remains an issue. Uh, so far, the best idea we came up to help with this is partnering with the private industry, and I'll touch on that a little bit later. Human resources and talents, retention, um, a lot of discussion about this. One thing that we kind of recognize that may be best way forward, obviously recruiting new talent, working with universities. We have a, we have a really good relationship with Colorado State University. But at the same time, recognizing it's really hard to have a uh, uh, domain uh, expert as well as a machine learning expert in one person. And uh, one of the options that we are exploring is really kind of offer training, additional training for existing scientists to kind of, we feel that it would probably be easier to, to train into application of machine learning algorithms and then allow existing scientists to, to kind of take over these new roles and become in that way part of the, this new research and development um, arena. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so based on these barriers, we identified some options for path forward. And one of them is really that we will have uh, established this working group across NOAA. So several of us who started this first workshop in November we stayed active, we are still actively participating, moving forward and maybe expanding our working group across NOAA to, to kind of include everybody or all aspects of, of NOAA enterprise. Um, and having in mind that we have issues and shortage of obviously human talent and, uh, and um, not shortage of talent, it's more like if we want people to, to take this off the ground and start seriously working on this, they have to drop other things. And somebody needs to make a decision or no leadership has to make decision what we will retire and sunset in order to indulge into this new arena. Um, so in order to do that, we proposed for no and actually started, I will briefly go through the latest developments, grouping our effort around big problems and we call them grand challenges. So we established three grand challenges across NOAA. One is making AI-based global uh, ensemble, a GEFS, which is global ensemble forecasting system, which would be fully coupled. Uh, we will do similar thing for the regional scale applications for convection resolving model. And then finally Warner forecast, which is very high resolution. And that's the work from our co colleagues at the National Severe Storm Laboratory. At this point, we, uh, started on all these three aspects of AI-based models, but the, the biggest thing that happened since November is that we started developing common infrastructure across NOAA because the, the whole thing is if we, uh, if for our scientists to allow them, uh, to, allow them to quickly get uh, uh, up to speed and perform uh, experiments, they really need to have easy way of running these experiments, which means they have to have this infrastructure in place that will allow them fast turnaround. So we made major progress on that. And that's also through collaboration between different NOAA laboratories and uh, uh, offices. Just briefly on partners, we do have uh, good partners in private industry, mainly NVIDIA and Microsoft. We are also working with AWS. 
Uh, and at the last week's workshop, there was there was a little bit of conversation how the government agency work better together. And one idea that came up from DOD colleagues was like maybe we should establish common standards and that would allow national uh, national labs or national agencies, uh, federal agencies to come together easier. With DOE, we have a lot of um, collaborations, but at the lower level at the scientific research projects. And I hope we expand it in the future. Thanks. Thank you. Um, let me start with this question. Um, and it says, given that ECMWF, which we'll hear from later today, leads in reanalysis um, for um, DLN and WP training and global modeling, should NOAA be trying to keep up in these areas or should you actually, you know, from a prioritization point of view, point of view focus on data that ECMF does not provide? Uh, so, for example, your regional and high scale um, training data there. Um, so, you know, it's really a question, are you, you kind of mentioned it as starting at the top with the whole global model, but have you considered really addressing, you know, really focusing on what's not covered right now? Yes, absolutely. And I, I had the note that just was rushing to finish in time. Uh, Yes, we, uh, our first choice for models that we are currently playing with was, is with uh, DeepMind uh, from Google DeepMind GraphCast, which only came as a pack prepackaged as a global application. But, and we are using it for our GEFS work that we started, but we are also made it uh, option to run it regionally, which is actually particularly very global systems laboratory expertise comes into place, it's regional application, high resolution, and then national mm -hmm. severe storm laboratory, very high resolution and very short lead times. So ERA-5 is great data set and it shows a lot of promises, but we also feel like NOAA eventually may invest in creating their own reanalysis with improved models and uh, which will require a lot of resources. And then in this workshop in November, particularly it was, discussed that we should invest into creating data sets for high resolution. We do have high resolution rapid refresh model mm -hmm. that has been operational for multiple years. We have that data available. The issue is it's obviously changed from year to year. Uh, and eventually we would want to have a kind of reanalysis for these scales mm -hmm. and for one of all yeah. especially. So, but that's going to be expensive. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I want to come back to trustworthiness and, and you kind of talked about this a little bit uh, within NOAA for all of your critical forecasts, you have a forecaster between whatever models are saying and what actually goes out as an official product. Uh, so you have a consumer, <laughs> you have a consumer within NOAA um, for these products. So I want to uh, we have a question here is there's one aspect of this, which is explainability AI, you know, um, and then the other is interpretab interpretable AI. And how do those two kind of come together in your mind for trustworthy AI? Um, okay, so, uh, so we, many years ago, we had a project when we were working with the forecasters and social scientists together of how to offer to forecasters a post-processed tool that will stop them from look or save them time and energy from looking at each and ensemble member right. separately, but rather look at the final tool. And the response, which was very eye-opening for me, I came in and I was like, well, this is a great tool. You, you can save your time. You just need to trust that this is what we have and this will make your process <laughs> and whole procedure much more efficient. And one thing that I learned very quickly, they're like, no, we are going to still go and evaluate each member separately because they gain experience that they, they have that kind of bias removal in their mind. And it's happening as they look at these models every day in and out. Mm -hmm. So to me, I think it, it, they will just have to be exposed to this model and gain experience, but empirical experience on a daily basis and just be more comfortable. So I'm not sure if that will go into, um, I guess that would be interpretational aspect. Yeah. Um, but then the other aspect that we talked about, I think that's more on the kind of physical scientist side who are going to work with these models and try to improve them. 
at some mm -hmm. point I do expect that we are starting with models that are pre-trained. The first step is we will train it with our data sets that we understand better. And then I assume next step will be our scientists kind of changing within the codes and algorithms, maybe introducing some more uh, physical constraints and, and kind of in that sense, developing these models into something that's very different than where we started. I'm not sure if that fully answered the question. Yeah, well, that's okay. Why don't you join us uh, at the table here? And we have um, some questions that I, you know, we didn't get to earlier. And um, Sangar, I wanted to start with you. Um, let me see if I can find it here. Um, you mentioned, um, I swear they just keep moving around these questions. <laughs> um, it, you mentioned that NASA has a new office that's starting to fund issues like AI trustworthiness and ethical AI. Do you, can you give us some insight into what type of research they might be funding there? Um, right now they are, what they're doing is uh, to fund some of the meetings and discussions. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think, I, I think they funded a couple of prototypes uh, at NASA centers and they have not put out the uh, open call yet, I believe. Okay. But that can be wrong. Okay. And I think you also mentioned you're actually having maybe some trouble getting reviewers with expertise in AI for some of this. And that kind of raised the question, are there special guidelines for uh, being developed for this area? Yeah, so, so that's a um, area that when we do, uh, when we put together the uh, review panel, we need a lot of uh, different expertise and a lot of the uh, consideration, you know, uh, you know, IDEA kind of uh, consideration too. So it's hard to put together a panel uh, that can review a lot of different expertise, mm -hmm. uh, different topical area, and also has the technical expertise yes. to review those. So um, certainly, we do try to try to manage uh, put the you know, program director's job to to recruit people um, to review that. Uh, but that's a recognized area of weakness when uh, new topics come in, uh, come up, and um, we don't have the enough uh, expertise. Uh, yeah, and I don't know whether DOE or NSF wants to comment on that at all either, um, but I think overall, you know, we still have a capacity in the workforce problem um, that has to be addressed here. Yeah. Um, so this next one may be uh, for Gary or maybe someone else, um, but it's pointing out that there's a, a number of federal requirements for like power and chemical facilities that require the use of pretty expensive meteorological towers for a couple of years to be assessing local weather <clears throat> and dispersion patterns. And the question is, <clears throat> do we think, um, AI plus historic data could be used instead um, that might mitigate some of these expensive requirements. Hmm. Good, good thought. <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite sure how to answer that, but we do have uh, some fairly sophisticated towers with our ARM user facility. But I think we prefer to have real observations as part of our analysis where AI can maybe supplement, but I would never sacrifice the real observations if we have the chance to make those. Okay. Yeah, I think we love our in-situ measurements. Uh, <laughs> and um, let's see if I can find this question. I had a, so um, we have a question here for you, Eric, that uh, I think you highlighted, we talked about this a little bit with Sung Sungar as well, is that we have a lot of satellite data that's not used. Um, and there's a lot of fundamental research that uh, to be done there. So would NSF be, it says NSF has avoided funding research related to NASA data. 
Is that changing um, in view of their now data-driven AI science approach? Not to my knowledge. I mean, you know, the joke is that NSF stands for no satellite funding. Um, and <laughs> probably many people have already heard that joke. Um, and it's, it's an oldie, but it's a goodie. Um, you know, I think the, um, there is no um, kind of filter that we apply, right? If someone wants to use NASA satellite data to conduct research in the research areas that we fund, then we certainly review those proposals alongside everything else. Um, I think it's, you know, a challenge that you could point to there is that um, a lot of people don't really know how to use that data um, to address um, hypothesis-driven basic science types of questions. You know, I mean, certainly we have seen people do interesting things with the kind of bread and butter data sets. You know, you look at the early studies of the Manjulian oscillation, they were all based on, you know, the OLR that was kind of, you know, remotely sensed. People certainly do stuff with uh, the sea surface temperature data that's all remotely sensed. You know, we, we know how to look for, you know, flavors of ENSO in that kind of, of data set. You know, um, by the time that data is used in an NSF project, it tends to be, you know, pretty well processed and, you know, pretty well vetted by people who are working on NASA's time and so on and so forth. Um, you know, the one place where uh, NSF has, I think, played in the satellite uh, world is in radio occultation, um, because my predecessor in the um, CLD program spearheaded the cosmic mission uh, that, that really got radio occultation on the map, uh, at least in the United States. Um, and I think there, the issue that we, that we face, I think, is something else, which is this desire to commercialize that data, you know, that rather than um, generating that data internally as a government asset, um, Congress is mandating data buys. The problem there is that, you know, when companies never want to sell you data, what they want is to sell you a limited license to look at it a little bit and to not share it with other people. You know, suddenly intellectual property issues rise right to the fore. You know, they're the first thing on the table, you know, and how these contracts are written. We don't currently have any kind of, you know, framework for mandating that this data be purchased in a way that it can be shared. You know, the thing about big data is that you need a lot of data. You know, big data is data hungry. You don't just need data, you need all of the data, all of it everywhere, all the time. That's what drives these systems, you know. And if you make any one of those pieces of data, every one of these comes a little tag that says, oh, you can do this and not that with it. Oh, it's in this format, not that format. All of that stuff just kills you when you're trying to deal with data at the petabyte scale, you know. And so I wouldn't see this as necessarily solely an AI issue, because certainly there's reasons for wanting that data to be freely and openly accessible that have nothing to do with AI. The fact that you care about climate change being the obvious one in my mind. Um, but certainly when you're, when you're wanting to spend, you know, billions of dollars on systems that require all of the data to be accessible, all the data to be sort of democratized and so on and so forth, that becomes a critical issue. You know, and it's, there really is no place that I can find where people are actively talking about that issue. The, the data commercialization issue, you know, it's it's not really on on, on, on strongly on the agenda of uh, of the professional societies, AMS and AGU. The National Academy is kind of afraid of these things because the politics of it is tricky, and the National Academy relies for funding on the federal government. Um, you know, the agencies can't talk about it because you know we're not allowed to lobby Congress for stuff that that happens to be a bee in our bonnet. You know, and so I think there is a risk that this is falling between the cracks. Um, I wanted to come back to this workforce development that's been acknowledged in some ways and maybe start with Isadora and see if, you know, what the discussion is at NOAA for kind of the talent that we're going to need in the future, that we need now and into the future. So, yeah, I, I guess we, uh, as I briefly mentioned, we are kind of looking from two, two different approaches. One is try to uh, uh, inspire young talent to come join us but then obviously we are facing the same issue as everybody else that private industry and other industries have much higher salaries so at that point we feel like the only reason we could bring this talent on board is like make make it exciting about the mission that NOAA has and how important that is for the nation so that's one aspect or one part that we are pursuing and another one and, and working definitely trying to work as much as possible with universities and universities collaborators 
And another one is recognizing, and I, I think somebody mentioned at the beginning that, that AI can be, uh, well, it comes under the trustworthy issues that, that existing scientists and colleagues are feeling threatened by the AI and their jobs will be taken away. So therefore we feel like it shouldn't be that way. And we, we really hope that we will um, kind of uh, eliminate that, that threat, if I may say, by providing additional training for the existing colleagues and developers to, to add that tool mm -hmm. to their box and kind of continue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Asangar, did you want to mention anything about workforce development from a NASA perspective? Well, certainly, I think, uh, um, you know, um, I think uh, Gary talked about this. We have domain science, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, subject matter. And there's a lot of uh, need, uh, new skills needed from the mathematical science and uh, computational uh, science for machine learning. And it's hard for individual to master, you know, both, <laughs> both right? So um, I think uh, we, um, we encourage people to build teams and, um, um, you know, once you have a very good cohesive team, you know, you, you find them work together, you know, the spots flying, you know, and those are, you know, uh, the re our reason experience that uh, basically built that kind of a collaboration. Mm -hmm. That's in incredibly important. Yeah. Okay. Um, Another question for you, uh, for NOAA here is, um, since the main mission of NOAA is forecasting for commerce and for human well-being, health, um, is there an internal assessment underway to consider which forecasting and early warning systems might benefit the most uh, from the addition of AI? You know, it sounds like you've got a lot of bottom-up stuff going, but uh, will there be a prioritization? <clears throat> Um, I, I may pass on this question. I, I wish there. Uh, um, well, yeah, I guess I, I, I almost feel that's the that's the most sensitive one. So mm -hmm. with the warns warnings and um, you I'll can just to say it's back. too soon. Yeah, it's that's too fine. soon. Yes. That's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Um, um, finally, I think we just have another minute or two here. Um, so one of the, it's kind of a comment here, but, um, you know, I think there's a lot of recognition that we need partnerships, you know, uh, across federal agencies and then with federal agencies out into the broader enterprise, whether it's private sector or whatever. Um, and we seem to have a lot going on at an individual PI level, but what's really needed is, you know, larger coordinated events. Um, efforts, larger coordinated efforts. So again, um, probably the closest we've had is AITES, which has been able to reach out, um, you know, across private sector like that. But, um, you know, maybe, you know, we need more of that. And I think I appreciate your comments, Eric, that that's a Investments on those scales are different from what we've been, you know, beyond NCAR are different from what we've had in this community in the past and how might that look, you know, and are some of those investments maybe appropriate to be made by multiple federal agencies, you know, to meet this challenge. So anybody, you know, could jump in here. Well, I mean, I think it's it's sort of TBD. I mean, if you look at the list of agencies that are supposedly kind of participating in the um, NAIRR, uh, AI yeah. the National oh. AI Research Resource, mm -hmm. um, it's a long list of agencies, but then it's a scary list of agencies. I'm going to have it in front of me here. Um, DARPA's in there. Okay, DARPA's doing a lot of stuff in this space. And I have no idea what it is. So that's a really interesting point. Um, and um, I mean, honestly, you know, I, I just don't know anybody at DARPA. It's just kind of its own thing. This is too bad because it's across the street from where I live. But um, NIST is here, you know, on this list. Uh, here's one, NIH. Here's, ooh, Veterans Affairs, right? I mean, if you tell me that I'm going to be, I'm going to engage in a partnership with Veterans Affairs, you know, you have to kind of give me a break here that I don't know how to do that. You know, that it's not something that's kind of easily accessible to me, that these things kind of take time. 
And I think this is the thing that you run into when you start talking about all of government approaches, you know, that you start looking at partners that you haven't worked with before. And each of us has our own agency mission and our own internal politics and so on and so forth. And so figuring out, you know, what makes sense, I think from that kind of push end mm -hmm. is not that easy. And sometimes it's easier to figure out what's going on the pull end, you know, because there at least we have our own experience to guide us. You know, I would say one of the best things that NSF ever did in the space of collaboration is to start up CESM, you know, because now you've got this global research yeah. community that's all using this model. There's various things that are feeding into it and Leap is developing stuff for it. And, you know, um, what is it, M2 lines, right? I mean, that's a, that's a Schmidt Foundation project, you know, and yet they're feeding it to CESM, right. you know. And so finding a killer app for the collaboration, you know, I think is how this actually is, works in practice. Um, but I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to accelerate the process of finding that special, special place in the Venn diagram where there's really something that, that, that we all ought to be doing. No, I think there are good comments. And I don't think anybody's looking for partnerships with 15 government agencies. But I just reflect a little bit on where this community has come from through USGCRP and you know where the leaders have been there in the federal agencies. And when we look at this AI challenge, um, it seems like what should be emerging is some development of national kind of data sets. And, um, and we're gonna hear from this this afternoon who's looking at this question of standards. I mean, I guess what I would say is yes, there's a, um, there's a thing called AI ready data sets. Mm -hmm. um, again, one of the things I really don't know what it is exactly. I've seen a nice present. It does. Yeah, it sounds perfect. Um, there's a very nice um, YouTube presentation you can watch from Ryan Abernathy, who invented Pangeo. Uh, he can explain it to you. Um, um, and, and I think he, what I mean by that in a, in a non glib way is that here is at least one example of a person who has a vision for what that is. Uh, you know, and I think a lot of it means, you know, taking data and getting it into these formats that, that languages like Python. Um, can use, you know, so that will be a thing. Um, another one, which actually I've just started talking to people about is um, automated differentiation. You know, it turns out that a lot of what goes on in the AI world is that you take codes and you adapt your code so that every time it makes a calculation, in effect, it takes the derivative of that calculation and carries that along with it. That's a really big deal in the AI world because AI works by minimizing cost functions and backpropagating. Backpropagating just means using the chain rule to figure out what input optimizes an output. You know, so if you can write codes that have AI automated differentiation built into them, that's a, that, that right there enables collaborations in a really profound way. You know, of course, it's not that easy to take two and a half million lines of CESM code and rewrite it in Python so you can do that. You know, I mean, figuring out what, what are going to be the test cases where you're gonna do this stuff and demonstrate the value of it and, 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 and the utility of it. Uh, that I think is a project that perhaps you know several agencies would have a stake in doing that because there's a lot of different things that you can do once you've got that in hand, um, you know. But again, you know, I, and maybe I should should, should defer to, to to Gary because he may also have some ideas for what ought to be done. Yeah, just a comment, and that is, at least we've been, and I know NSF has done this too, and that is uh, look at different types of data sets, data archives and bridge them together so that they're more compatible. Within the climate space, that's extremely important, especially when you have databases in ecology and biogeochemistry, which we all know provides some important feedbacks to climate projections. But getting those databases together with other databases so that uh, any scientist can actually access all of it with, within one push of a button. So I, I think that's something we're putting more emphasis on so that if there are training data uh, to be used for AI, it can tap into different types of archives that we know need to be uh, connected. Okay, I see we're out of town, town time. Um, I'd like you to uh, join me in thanking our panelists today. And we're on break for the next 55 minutes. If